I'm Timmy Pierce, Executive Director of the Historical Society of Carroll County, and we are at our 12th Annual Antiques Appraisal Day. And this is all made possible with a lot of hard work from a lot of people, a lot of volunteers and staff. People throughout the day are having their items appraised. The fee is $20 for the first item, $10 for the second, $5 for the third. Our appraisers are all experts in their various fields and they are donating their time to us today as well. Well, it's American Maine and Sonia, which is a well-known name. Usually the figures on these are Greek gods. It would be called a mantle clock. I don't think it would take a whole lot for somebody to clean that and get it running. What happens when they get moved around is that clocks are, the clocks are always a little touchy. But it's, it's definitely oh, yeah, it, it running. Runs. It's got a porcelain it face. Runs and it chimes. The porcelain face is unusual. The clock company was in operation from 1851 to 1878 in Anstonia, Connecticut. It's A-N-S-O-N-I-A. -N then it was moved to New York City between 17, 1879 and 1930. But this one's definitely Victorian. And they dismantled the company and sold it to Russia in the 30s. About $1,500. <laughs> Just because this one is particularly nice. It could go higher because um, you've got all your original paint and, and it's still working, which is unusual. You can, I can see it working. It, just be careful not to overwind it. It probably just needs a good cleaning and don't let anybody do too, don't do too much to the finish because that, you just a little light dusting with maybe a paintbrush. Oh, the pressure went good. Well, was it what you were expecting? No. What were you expecting? About four or five hundred dollars. My sister had it up in Marydale, Pennsylvania, and uh, the appraiser went and offered him hundred thirty-five dollars for it. And I told him I'll buy it for hundred thirty-five. So we bought it about thirty years ago from him. I think I love this type of watch, but nowadays they're not as popular. Right. They call them pantyhose snaggers. Yeah. They, uh, yeah. You're right. Because of all these little points, and they're they're harder to wear. So it really comes down to being a specialized watch that someone enjoys mm -hmm. on on a special occasion. I would think that this piece, and it appears that the band is also white gold as well, would probably sell like retail in a store around like 850 900 some dollars. That's retail. Yeah. I can see where it got its nickname though. The what did you say? Yeah. And it was Snagger. 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 And, yeah. And in the 50s little. they were known for that. They would create these pieces that were so, you know, so many prongs and spiky and they would snag your sweaters and your clothing all the time. So, you know, it's a collectible piece but it's hard to wear every day. So, you know. It's, it's a, made by a company called Steve. It's a, it's a Baltimore pattern. It's called Rose. Um, people in the trade call it Reposé because it, the silver's really banged out. It's very three-dimensional. In fact, if you do a close-up on that, you can see how, how floral and how decorative the pattern is. And um, she has a complete set of it, a service for eight. And um, it's worth about $15,000 a set. I thought it would be a little higher, to be honest. <laughs> but um, that's fine. I'm satisfied right now. I might try to sell it. You know, that, uh, my daughter doesn't want this pattern. And, you know, I can't see my son with it. No. <laughs> so, I already have two. <laughs> so I think I'm going to try to sell it. We're excited to be here this morning. This is our 12th year of Antiques Appraisal Day, and uh, we have a wonderful crowd with us today already this morning. Uh, some really neat uh, appraisers here. We're very fortunate to have the appraisers uh, volunteer their time. And already I've seen a lot of interesting artifacts, so we hope every, everybody enjoys themselves. This is a very important part of our effort at the Historical Society to, to involve our community with some interesting things and um, I don't want to forget to uh, uh, not to thank our sponsors who have helped us uh, put this whole thing together. I uh, was in the automobile business up to uh, started in 1961 and, uh, and uh, 
So I thought I'd purchase a 1961 Impala, which is uh, a one owner, two owner car, but it's been garage kept the whole time. It's everything's original, uh, except the uh, tires and the battery. Um, and it's uh, got 67,000 miles on it. And uh, it's a uh, beautiful light green, which catches everybody's eye, which, uh, Makes me feel good when I when, I, when I'm riding down a road and they all put their thumbs up, yay! <laughs> so it's, this car is remarkable because of its condition, because it has been garage capped. You can look inside and see it's all re original. It's remarkably good condition, and what we call baby boomers cars are the height of fashion right now. And people want to buy the cars they remember that they couldn't afford when they were young. So these cars are, are going up in value. Where cars from maybe the 30s and 40s are uh, have gone down in value because there's nobody that wants them as much as the people want their cars they remember. I'd say between 70 and 100,000 simply because it's rarity. The average ones are ranging maybe 40 to 60 for one in, in really remarkable condition that's been restored. Lower end ones maybe 23,000 but I, t I usually double it if I think that the car is very rare for any reason and if it's perfect. And your car is pretty much perfect. It's as perfect as it can be for being that old. Right. And in the color, you've got a really good color. Yeah, I, I like See, that. See, that color's make, making it worth more, too, because yeah. that's the color you think of at that period. Yeah, the enamel paint, too. That beautiful holds too. up good. Yeah. It's, it's actually an art object with those, mm -hmm. those beautiful lights in the back, right. and yeah. like the rocket tail lights. Right. Yeah. I'm flabbergasted. <laughs> I didn't think it was worth anywhere near that. <laughs> that, was, that was something else. Well, I got a lot of people who want to buy it, but uh, I don't think they're going to pay uh, that much money for it. <laughs> but anyway, it's, I'm going to keep it for a while because it's a, it's a treasure to me because I was in the automobile business for 30 years and uh, Chevrolet uh, was my favorite car. And uh, that was a year I started in business. It's my personally, it was a, 61 when we all started. Of course, our business been there longer than that, but uh, it kind of brings back old memories. So, uh, and when I see the car and everybody looks at me, it, it makes you feel good. <laughs> These were the last single shot guns issued to American troops by the United States government before there was the revolver, before Colt invented the revolver. So you got one shot out of this, and that was it. That was and then you had to reload it. Uh, again, these typically were used by cavalry, and um, a lot of single-shot pistols, uh, they were all loaded from the front. So this is called a muzzle-loading single-shot pistol. Uh, and this ramrod here is actually attached so it doesn't get lost if you're on horseback. So in order to load it, you know, you put the powder down, then the ball, and then you tamped it down like this to the bottom. Um, and then you could return the ramrod. Right? It's a little clumsy, but at least you wouldn't lose this because once you lost this, then the pistol was not good to you. Yeah, I can remember. You wouldn't be able to shoot it. So. <laughs> um, made by um, Henry Aston in Middletown, Connecticut, and so marked on the lock plate in 1849. So this would have been produced after the Mexican War and before the American Civil War. The Mexican War was over in 1848. Uh, the Civil War started in 1860. Uh, so this probably would have been carried by um, either a United States trooper or a state militia trooper uh, prior to the Civil War. Lots of these went off to war in 1861 when the Civil War broke out. Uh, but because the revolver had six shots, and this had one, a lot of these were quickly replaced by right. the revolvers. Yeah, one shot doesn't help you a whole lot. No, not really. But unless you have two of them, then you've got two <laughs> shots. Um, it's in really a pretty nice condition. Um, what is important about its condition are these little marks in the stock. So these marks down here in the stock are not so significant. Interestingly enough, as far as the value is concerned, these marks in this stock are very significant because they were lightly stamped in here, and these were the two uh, government inspectors. So Henry Ashton was a contractor to the United States government, and each one of his guns that the government purchased was inspected by a government guy, two government guys, and they each stamped their initials in a little cartouche on the side of the gun which meant it met the quality standards of the United States government and could be accepted and he could get paid for this particular product. Um, so the reason 
it enhances the value is that these are pretty light stamps. So guns that were used heavily, these wore off they were quick. Okay. So the fact that they're as crisp and clear as they are and you can still see them and read them is significant uh, for the, for the uh, value of the gun. So these guns, this gun in this condition, um, with the inspector's marks, is worth between $900 and $1,100. Okay, pretty nice. Yep. It was appraised for five to six hundred dollars. Uh, it's actually my father's. I brought it in today to get appraised. Okay, and uh, it, how long has your dad had it? He said about sixty-three years. Really? Yes. Do you know where he got it? Was it? Uh, his parents bought it for him. For him. For him. Wonderful. So, yeah. um, are you going to put it on display? Um, I'm going to talk to him about it. If possible. <laughs> You're not going to play with it, are you? <laughs> no, 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 absolutely not. And it looks like his mouth moves. Yes, it yes. moves. Oh my land, that is so neat. I love his boots too. <laughs> yeah. HD, howdy <laughs> doody. <laughs> this is by uh, the famous photographer Aubrey Boudin, most well known for his uh, mostly Maryland photographs. And uh, this is a print of one of his photographs, which photographs in themselves are printed, but the signature is also printed, so it's not a signed piece. But um, he was one of the most well-known photographers of our time, local photographer as well. Um, it's printed in the same method this is printed, which is an offset lithograph. But it is a nice old one, probably with about $125. Okay. But it's a beautiful piece. It's still one of his old, it really older is ones. A beautiful piece. His stuff is incredible. Look, look at the reflection. I, yeah. And it's, you know, it's all framed with a net. And we've been through all of his stuff and we could not find this Very print anywhere. Lovely. We bought it because we really, really liked the picture. And we thought we would just take a look and see if it was another um, valuable piece. We will probably have it reframed and hung in our house because we love it. It's always a... Uh an act, very active day as we have uh, our appraisers uh, appraising all manner of antiques brought in by uh, the general public. We also depend uh, greatly on volunteers during the day and also those who uh, go out and get ads for us, get sponsors for us. It's a, uh, quite an operation devoted to uh, uh, helping the Historical Society uh, maintain its budget and move forward. This is a, uh, a print of the surrender of Lord Cornwallis to General George Washington at Yorktown. Uh, that event occurred in 1781. This print was done by Nathaniel Currier, uh, later of Currier and Ives, in 1845. Appraised for about how much? About $150. I think it was very helpful and very informative. Um, I didn't really have any preconceived amount in my mind. I had no idea what it was worth, so I wasn't expecting anything, any certain amount one way or the other. Not sure if we'll keep it in the family or if we'll try to sell it. We're not sure. It's a soft paste porcelain. Uh, it's not a hard paste. And you can tell that, you know, we're... Her husband apparently got drunk one night with his buddies <laughs> yeah. and picked these things up. But you My can mom, see that. she didn't really care about no. that, but I did. Did you say how old they are? The They're turn of, the turn of the century, like century? circa 1900. Uh-huh. Very, and, very and, you know, g given the condition that they're in, you know, there, there's some chips. And, you yeah. know, some of the paint's been rubbed off. Right. If a dealer had this set, um, you know, it probably retails for about $250, $300 for the set. Right. That's, if it was in perfect condition, you might bump that up a little bit, but it's not. So it is what it is. It's very pretty. It's very yes, interesting yeah, to have the yes, cops with the picture. Yeah, yeah. And I like the scenes. I like the I like the monks. Yeah. I like the horses on that one, that yeah. last one. That's uh -huh. neat. Yeah. Uh -huh. But it is interesting because you have like a hunt scene, then you have the monk. And then you have the the ladies. Right. You know, yeah. they're, they're they're sort of all you know, they're, they're all sort of Victorian but unrelated. Like you'd almost think you have them all monks or all hunt scenes. It's just it's weird the way you have the variety. Oh, I put it back in my china closet. I guess I enjoy them. Uh, I don't know if my kids would. I don't know. Maybe I'd sell them if I, even if I could get a couple hundred dollars. <laughs> I don't know, but I, I love them. They started calling these carnival glass because in the 50s and 60s they had lesser versions of these uh, at carnivals and you pitch pennies into them. Um, so that's how they started being called carnival glass. But in the early 1900s when a lot of these were made, these better pieces were made, they were called iridescent glass. And chemists actually put the colors on by hand. Each one was a piece of art. And they went from factory to factory like 
you know, Fenton would go, somebody from Fenton would go to Westmoreland. So you'll see the same colors from factory to factory, but each one is fairly unique. But they would steal each other's chemist. So each one is, is truly a piece of art, and then each, each pattern has a name. And see you can see where this, the see, the, see the color was actually applied by chemists, but see how it was applied on a blue ball. That's and then this one, you can see, it was applied on either an amethyst or red color ball. Mm -hmm. This would be like a fruit, caught a fruit basket, but you, it, they're, they're really a type of art glass, which are art glass is not meant to be really used. It's meant to be decorative. But even the little feet of this one, look, they put little tree feet on it. Uh -huh. It took all this special time. These, these were like art objects. Like I said, in, in the 50s and 60s, um, you'll see less expensive versions, mostly of an orange pattern, like a marigold color. You'll see a lot of it around, and they started calling it car carnival glass because there's a there's a lot of it left around from the factories, and it, and it wasn't as fashionable. So the carnivals had it, and people pit pitch pennies in it and get. Did set. you say what the, these date back to? These uh, early 1900s. All right, let's start with this. This actually is a Civil War period holster. Um, had some interesting repairs. Uh, because this apparently broke at some point during its use. Um, it split here, so as you can see, there's some little iron rivets, and they look like they were done during the period of use. So the soldier's holster broke, he had it repaired in the, in the field probably, and then put it back on his head. Um, and this was actually made for a Colt revolver. <clears throat> this is not a Colt revolver. And is a larger gun than a Colt revolver. So the soldier who was issued this gun actually sliced the holster to so fit this fit. gun. Okay. So that's kind of interesting because that means that this gun and this holster were used together. It wasn't just a gun purchased over here and a holster purchased. Over here. So, uh, so that's pretty cool. So some Civil War trooper carried this on his hip with this gun in it. Okay. Um, this is one of Colt's competitors. Um, it was made by, uh, it was invented by a fellow named Nathan Starr, S-T-A-R-R, -R, and his patent was right prior to the Civil War, and it's marked here, patented 1856. Uh, but these didn't go into production until right around the Civil War, because, you know, um, so the, the mechanism was patented, but it didn't go into production until there was a market for them. So when the Civil War began, the government contracted with Nathan Starr to make these uh, Starr revolvers. Um, again, you had six shots, but you still had to load it individually. So um, each cylinder had to be loaded. Again, you had to pour powder into it, then put the ball on top, then use this ram to ram the load all the way down. So okay. you had to sit there and load each cylinder like that. So when you're out in the field, once you've finished your six shots, you couldn't like load it like we can today. You had to take some time. Yeah, but everybody else had the same disadvantage. Okay, so, uh, but having six shots again was better than one. Um, this one also was a government issue gun. Um, and you, the, the inspector's marks aren't quite as clear, but can you see that little cartouche yeah. down the bottom there? It's barely there. Yeah. And then on this side, there's another one. You can just barely sort of see the top line. Yeah. But in addition to that, the government inspector put his initials on some metal parts. So there's a little H there. There's a little B here. Oh. So guns that were not issued or purchased by the federal government would not have those marks. Okay. So that enhances the value of this. Um, this gun is in a little bit rougher condition than we like to see, but some of it may be because it's been stored in kind of a damp leather holster for so many years. It has been cleaned at some point because obviously this was very rusty uh, at some point, uh, or that pitting wouldn't be there. So a lot of rust accumulated here on the, the gun cylinder uh, and on this area um, here. He must have cleaned it. Well, yeah, probably so. Uh, but still, with its government marks and its original holster, um, has some good value. And I would say in the neighborhood of, let me just check one more. Five, eight, seven. Five, eight, 
7. These guns were serial numbered and it's important that all the serial numbers match, and they do. Um, because after the war, a lot of times parts were swapped out, and so you'd get one serial number on this piece and another serial number, and that really degrades the value, but this has all matching serial numbers. Uh, Value-wise on this, with its original holster, um, is probably 1200 to 1300 Well, again, the money is never, it's, it's more the, the stories of... Yeah him, you know, bringing him out and showing him to us. But I was so young, I don't remember, you know, I don't remember all the stories. Well, talk to your mom a little bit. I'm sure she would remember. It might more. be great for you all to take some notes yeah. about these guns um, and, and about the stories behind these guns. So, yeah. you know, you'd want to know, uh, well, all right, so maybe your dad brought this back from World War II, but it would be interesting to know where he got this. And well, I learned a lot more about how they actually worked, which was interesting because the stories passed down, you know, from my grandparents and back and forth. Um, we tend to forget over the years, so it's really neat to see how they actually worked, you know, and I think uh, with the information he's given me, I could try to look up a little bit more, you know, along with talking to my mom about the actual stories, um, right, right. you know, so, where they came from. And, so but, now you want to try to get some more family history. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Good. yeah. Great. It's again, it's something that, like you said, if it's not written down through the years, you forget mm -hmm. where where they came from, and so, so it's something write to write it down. down. You're yes. going to record it. Good. Yes. So the next generation will know. Will know exactly, and they won't have to try to to figure it out. But it's really neat because it takes you back to when. You know, when you're young and you're with your grandparents, and he would sit and bring it out every once in a while and just talk away, and I just brings all those memories oh, back. Isn't that precious? Yeah, that's, miss that. That's so great. if I can sort of recreate that, good. it would be good. Good. This is a real Salvador Dali. So you have like um, you have dinner plates, and there's a company that that sold these by subscription. Um, I, I'd say 40s, 50s, 60s, and almost everything they sold to people, which you think you get. Su by subscription art, like a magazine, you get these things in the mail. The I, I don't know if they picked them out or not, but almost all the artists were famous and became very famous. Who, who's the artist? This is Salvador Dali. Wow. This is a real etching of a Salvador Dali. Where did you get it? It was my grandfather's. And it's got its authenticity papers, and this is, it's, a, I can't, I'm not good at reading French, but it's Society de Verification de la Gravure International of New York and Paris, and they weren't all this stuff, and it was the Collector's Guild that sold these, and they, and almost everyone I've ever seen is, you know, a well-known artist, and were somebody that became well-known. Some of the people weren't well-known when they started. And even though it's an etching, it's considered an original because etchings are original pieces of artwork. It's not, they're not worth a huge amount of money. So a couple hundred dollars. Really? Couple. Wow. These are not real rare. There's lots of them around. So there's um, they're not worth as much as you might think of a Some of his things were signed at a later date, even. A lot of people were suspicious of some of these things, but this by the collector's guild is a real piece. I'm not going to get you guys through college, but yeah. it's fun to hang on the wall. Hang on to it, you never know. Okay, Lindy. Thanks so much. Can't thank enough uh, all the people who have contributed through the sponsorships, the ads, the patrons, uh, and of course their, their time today uh, as we uh, move forward through the day. This is a big fundraiser for the Historical Society, and we always, as we say, appreciate your support, however you may be able to support.